Really excited uh, to have our first keynote, to have our keynote speaker and the first speaker of the day. Um, we had Jared speak at our previous Design Leadership Summit last year. Um, and I still remember when I reached out to him, uh, you know, at that time we hadn't put up no conferences, we were just a local, almost a local design community. And he immediately agreed, and he was like, yeah, I'll come. And I was like, oh, really? OK. <laughs> Seems like this is happening now. Uh, but yeah, he gave an amazing talk last year. Again, we had a full house on how design is a team sport, uh, which was from you know, talking about setting better uh, expectations so we can have better outcomes, to all the way to learning how we should be training, refining, and mastering with every designer uh, on our teams. Uh, his talk set the underlying theme, and that's one feedback we got last year, that his talk set the underlying theme for all the uh, talks that followed throughout the day. Uh, so we, we hope that again happens today as well. Um, so with the multiple requests you know, that we got from our community and the amazing feedback that we got, the feedback form did have specific mentions to him uh, last year throughout all the, uh, all the entries. So we're really excited to welcome back uh, Jared Spool as our keynote speaker. Let's have a big round of applause for Jared. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot of you. Uh, so uh, putting on an event like this is a tremendous amount of work. And uh, the Preet and the community have done an incredible job doing this. And I think we should be making some noise for that. So let's make some noise. <laughs> OK. So in our community, we talk a lot about getting people to value design. We talk about do organizations value design. But how do we actually tell if an organization values design? Well, one way you can tell is by how much money they spend on making great things and how much investment they make there. So we started to ask the question, well, how would we go about looking to see if, in fact, who is spending the most money, right? What is going on? And we went off to find the most expensive UX projects we could find, and we found one. It's the most expensive one that's ever been done. And oddly enough, it's a bracelet. In fact, it's the Disney Magic Band. They spent a billion dollars on this project. And it does not even tell time. <laughs> Which is weird, because they're famous for their watches, right? Mickey Mouse watches. So if you don't know about this thing, you buy these things when you book a vacation at the park. And they come in the mail in a beautiful box with your favorite characters on them. Each one of the bands is customized to a family member. Uh, the bands are, are tailorable in that regard. Inside is, is technology, of course. They have three different types of radio transmitters. They have a, uh, a RFC, uh, uh, RFID, I mean, uh, uh, for payment processing, they have NFC for, for uh, near field communications, and they have a GPS inside this thing, so that the band knows where you are everywhere you go in the park. It uh, will, because of those transmitters, it will let you into your hotel room. It will let you uh, have VIP access to any of the rides. It will let you just wave your arm and pay for anything you want, even if you wanted to. And it, uh, my favorite feature is, if you want, if it's, let's say it's your kid's birthday, which is a common scenario, right? Kids show up uh, 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 on their birthday at Disney. That's a special trip. They can use the GPS in the band to have the kid's favorite character hunt them down and wish them a happy birthday. It's a little creepy, <laughs> but it's cool. 
Uber has taught us that creepy and cool can exist in the same set, <laughs> as has Facebook. But the thing that is most amazing to me about the, uh, about the, the Magic Band is not the technology, it's not the functionality, it's not the interaction design or the visual design of the apps, it's none of those things. What is fascinating to me is that it was built by Disney. And the reason that that's particularly interesting to me is that I first started working with Disney on a variety of designs back in 1997. I, uh, uh, the first thing we paid attention to were the things that the Disney Parks and Resorts team were producing. In particular, we were looking at the Disney website, and this was the best they could do. <laughs> right? This was it. This was the pinnacle of Disney capability online. Now, I know it's gorgeous, but you should see how it works. It sucked. It absolutely sucked. And in fact, it was so bad that you could not complete a reservation online for the park without actually getting on the phone and calling their call center and finishing it on, uh, on the phone. It was so hard to use that we started using it as a tool for training people on how to do usability testing. Because it turns out when you train people to conduct usability tests, it helps if you have something unusable for them to practice on. Because then they can find the unusable bits and they can work through how they handle interacting with a participant in a study uh, uh, during that. So we created a bunch of tasks. My favorite one for training was actually based on a real uh, a, a real scenario that we'd uncovered talking to someone who was a real Disney fanatic, what, what the Disney people refer to as a world file, someone who goes all the time and just loves the parks. And she uh, was a person of reasonable means who had a six-year-old kid who loved trains. And so she wanted to be able to go to Disney World and bring her kid and stay someplace where they could take the monorail everywhere, because she thought that the kid would love every day being able to stay on the monorail. So we set out to create a test task to see, well, how easy it is, is it to, to actually figure that out, right? What is, in fact, the least expensive hotel uh, that's on the monorail at Walt Disney World? Now, it turns out there's only three hotels out of the 24 that are on the monorail at Walt Disney World, the Grand Floridian, the Contemporary Resort, and the Polynesian. And it turns out that two of those are wicked-ass expensive, which means one of them is the Polynesian. That was the answer. So there it is. It's that easy. Just all you have to do is find the Polynesian Resort. You're done with the task. And what we found over years of watching people actually perform this task as we were training folks to conduct usability tests is we noticed that there was a pattern that in fact, out of the hundreds of people that we got to watch do this task, only about 10 out of every 100, one out of 10 people would actually succeed, 10%. 90% would fail at this task. And what was even more fascinating was of the people who failed at the task, two out of every 10 people would choose a hotel in Disneyland instead of Walt Disney World. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with the difference between Walt Disney World and Disneyland, they are very different. <laughs> there are many things that are different about them. Probably the one that stands out the most is that they are 3,000 miles apart. <laughs> now, in training people to do this task, we would, uh, we would ask them 
to basically uh, uh, explain what it is that's causing the confusion. But you can't just say that to someone. You can't say, what's causing your confusion? You got it wrong, what's causing your confusion? You have to ask questions. And so we would train the, the moderators for the studies to ask sort of follow-up questions. And, and the follow-up question we would train them to ask is, if we saw this mistake, which we saw a lot, was could you ride the monorail from your hotel to Epcot Center, which only exists in Walt Disney World? And the participants would inevitably turn back to the machine. They'd click around the Disney website for a bit. They'd turn back to the moderator and they'd say, yes. Yes, you can. Now, I just want to point out that the monorail is a six-car train that travels at approximately 45 kilometers per hour, and it has to go 3,000 miles, and it has no bathroom. <laughs> so this is a very long trip for that vehicle, and you cannot ride the monorail from the hotels at Disneyland to Epcot Center. But the users couldn't tell. They, they thought they were in the right place. A few years later, I was giving a presentation. I was talking about this finding that we'd had in the presentation. Uh, talked about a bunch of other things. At the end of the presentation, I'm packing up my laptop and uh, uh, getting off the stage. And there's a couple people waiting to talk to me. And one of them has a badge from the conference that says, Walt Disney World Parks and Resorts. And I introduced myself, she introduced herself, and she says, can I tell you something? I'm like, sure. She says, you can't tell anyone. I'm like, okay. <laughs> she says, we have people show up all the time in Orlando with Anaheim reservations. Right? So this wasn't just our studies this was happening in. This was happening everywhere. And not only that, but I come to learn that they keep a block of rooms because Disney is so thoughtful. They do not want to ruin your vacation. So they keep a block of rooms reserved even at the peak season when the entire resort is completely sold out. They have a block of empty rooms waiting that they could have sold but waiting for someone to show up, inevitably, with reservations for a hotel on the other side of the country. Now think about that for a second. This is their most valuable asset. They are keeping it in reserve, not generating revenue from it. They are not selling those hotel rooms because it was cheaper to do that than to fix the damn website. <laughs> And that's where Disney was in 1997. That's where they were. And here we are in 2014 when they ship a billion dollar UX project. It cost them a billion dollars. They made all that money back inside the first year. It delivers an incredible experience to guess. And the question I have is, how did they make that change? How did they get from 1997 Disney to 2014 Disney? Because if we can unlock that, we can figure out how to get our organizations to start delivering better designs. So to understand that, we have to understand how we understand things. Those of you who, who came to my presentation last year, we're gonna, I'm going to review a little bit here because there's, this is important to understand, which is in order for us to learn something new, let's say it's a language or an instrument or how to cook or how to design, we have to go through four stages. Now, the first stage we call unconscious incompetence. We are, at this point, we're not good at what we do. That makes sense. We just started. Why would we be good right out of the gate? We're definitely not going to be good at this. So we're incompetent at it. 
But we also don't know how incompetent we are. We are just completely unaware of how incompetent we are. In fact, from our perspective, we're doing pretty good, right? You pick up an instrument, you plunk at the notes, and it sounds like a song, and you're like, hey, I couldn't do that yesterday. That was pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm good at this. And you start to cook something, and it tastes pretty good. I'm good at this, right? And people exist in this stage for a long time sometimes. The thing that gets them out of the stage usually is a close friend takes them aside and says, please stop. <laughs> no, seriously, just don't, it's not good. Don't do this anymore. You know, we humored you for a while. And it's at that point that we enter the next stage, which is conscious incompetence. Before this, we did not know how bad we were. Now we do. We're not any better, we're still incompetent, but we definitely know we're not good at it. And this is a place where lots of people give up. After all, all of us were amazing artists up until the age of six or so, right? Everything we did went into that art gallery that gets installed in every house on the refrigerator. And everything was, that's amazing, those squiggles, yes, I can see where you were going with that, that's fantastic. I get your mood right now, right? But then at some point, we realize we can't draw. Somebody says to us, we find out, you know what, we can't draw. And we stop. We give up. And that's what happens to most people. They don't get past conscious incompetence. But a few people persist. And they start to learn that if we practice, if we figure out what the routines are, we will suddenly be able to move beyond this and get good outcomes. If we understand the recipe and we follow the recipe, if we look at the sheet music and we follow the notes exactly and we practice, we will actually get decent. And at that point, when we can predictably produce good outcomes, we get to the stage of conscious competence. We now can do good work but we have to pay attention to every note in the music, or we have to pay attention to every ingredient and step in the recipe. If we deviate from that for just a second, we screw it up, it's, it's awful. But as long as we keep at it, we keep practicing, we keep going, at some point, and it happens to everyone, at some point, we stop needing the music. We stop needing the recipe. We can get good outcomes without having to think about every step we do. And it's at that point that we become unconsciously competent. And unconscious competence is that moment where we are succeeding at what we're doing. And we are able to, to tackle problems that we couldn't see before. And we can see problems coming that nobody else can see. That's the ultimate goal of learning something. And we can think about the transitions between these stages. The first one, from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence, we can think of that as literacy. Literacy is First, just learning the difference between good and bad quality. When we are here in unconscious incompetence, we can't tell the difference between good and bad quality. We just don't see it. It's, as everything we produce is, looks the same. And it's in, unconscious, it's in conscious incompetence that we now see the difference. We don't know what to do to get better quality, but we do know that something can be done. It can happen. When we transition from conscious incompetence to conscious competence, that's fluency. That's when we learn the grammar, we learn the, 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 the chords, we learn all of the steps, we understand how the tools flow together, we can see the patterns. And we can start to use that by practicing to become more fluent, more capable. And we can start to handle the tasks, we don't need to, to uh, uh, define everything from the very beginning. We understand the definitions. We understand the grammars. 
And it's the transition from conscious competence to unconscious competence that is mastery. That's when we actually, when we talk about mastering our craft, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about that step, that transition. And we can't even begin to think about mastering the craft if we're not literate in it or we're not fluent in it. So we need to do those things. Now, that's for an individual. And I was talking about Disney. So how does Disney fit into this? Well, it turns out that there's a similar pattern. It's not quite the same, but it follows the same for an organization. An organization starts in what we call the Dark Ages. <laughs> and the Dark Ages, from a UX design perspective, nobody understands that a design exists. It, 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 at best, it's, you know, painting things with nice colors, but even then, they don't really think about it, right? When an organization's in the dark ages, they're only thinking about meeting business needs and meeting technology needs. Can we get something delivered that actually does what it's supposed to do, right? And it's, it's, the user doesn't factor in on this at all, right? This is where we end up with, you know, well, if they can't figure it out, we'll train them, right? Training is the opposite of usability. And we can look here and basically say, you know, in the dark ages, look, we just need to get this thing out in the world. That's what the dark ages is. But there is an inflection point. And the inflection point happens when someone on the team often someone who has been hired in new, who's come from someplace where users existed, <laughs> says, you know, we have users. If we made something better for our users, it would be good. And everybody goes, okay, that sounds interesting. Can we get back to work now? And they start to push. And they, they decide, okay, this little part of the world that I control, we're gonna make something for users. We're gonna build something that's actually good to use and they actually build something that works. And we call this stage spot UX design. This is when you have individual contributors or low-level management who push hard enough that they can get the world around them to produce something usable. The rest of the organization is still producing the same stuff. And oftentimes, this will catch everybody's attention. This thing will go out and everybody goes, that's really cool. We didn't know you could, we had users. That's really awesome. But over time, the organization habits kick back in. Everybody says, okay, get back to work, ship something. And we stop paying attention to users. But there's another inflection point. And the inflection point happens when we get someone who has enough power in the organization, an executive or someone at a very senior level who controls enough budget to say, no, no, this user thing, this is actually important. This is important strategically, it's important to our organization. We need to actually deliver things for users. Maybe it's because users are complaining that they're going to competitors because we're unusable, or maybe it's because we're losing sales, or maybe it's because there's some small competitor who is making a big deal about design, or maybe it's, you know, I love my iPhone, why don't we ship things like the iPhone? But there's something that is causing an executive to say, no, no, we need to make an investment. And at that point, a team gets formed. There's designers and researchers and managers and copy people, and we start to think about users as part of a service that we deliver to other parts of the organization. So we have this design as a service element that exists that we then use to ship to the rest of the organization. And our goal is to anybody who wants to make their particular part of the organization more user friendly, we're gonna be there, we're gonna help you, we're gonna help do that for you. And we offer that service. And at first, it's all about just getting anybody to take us up on this. But teams start to do it, and they start to see results if we're any good at what we do. And other teams start to wanna do it, and other management starts to say, hey, why aren't you doing this? And suddenly, we have demand. And if we do a good job, 
we might actually get that seat at the table. Apparently, there's a table. <laughs> I imagine it has Herman Miller chairs. <laughs> and at that table is where things happen. OK, between you and me, don't tell anyone else because they get really freaked out. Particularly, don't tell the other speakers because they're going to all talk about the table. There is no table, <laughs> right? It's not a table. I mean, there's a conference room table. There's a conference room. And really, when you get a seat at the table, it just means you get to go to more meetings than you had before. <laughs> right? That's pretty much it. What there is is there's a shift. When we talk about desiring a seat at the table, what we're talking about is a shift from being reactive to being proactive. We want to be involved in the decisions of the things that get set into stone by the time they get handed to us now so that we can actually say, you know, there's a better way to fix this. We shouldn't be putting lipstick on the pig. We should actually be, you know, deciding are we shipping pigs. And so, uh, and nothing against pigs, I got to tell you. There are, there are good reasons to ship a pig. Uh, uh, you know, if, for instance, you're in the pork industry, this is a popular thing, but nonetheless, there, we used to think that if we could get that seat at the table, that was the ultimate. We would be the ones who were setting out the agenda for design across the organization. Everybody would instantly bow to our de uh, uh, desire to do this, and we would win. Turns out there's another inflection point, and it's a weird one. The inflection point happens when one or more of the teams that we've been working with starts to get angry with us because they can't get enough of our services, because that centralized design team that's a service to the rest of the organization, we have to serve the whole organization. And we don't have enough people to serve the whole organization. And there's no way we will ever have enough people to serve the whole organization. And that team, they don't like it when we pull the designer who'd been working for, with them for the last three months off to work on another project that's, quote, more important. And they get really frustrated. They want their own designer. And it's at that point that we get to embedded UX design. And embedded UX design is when we now have designers embedded in the team. And this is more than just being co-located. This is the designer is a team member. They report to the team's management, not to the design management, which is really critical. Because when there's a disconnect between the team's management and the design management in the organization, the team management has to win. So that person has to report into their structure. But the centralized design team still exists. They have to support that team. And that's the stage of embedded UX design. And for a long time, we thought this was the ultimate, that if we could get a designer or two embedded in every product and service team across the organization, we win. That's the achievement we're trying to unlock. And then we learned there's one more inflection point. And that inflection point happens when people on those teams, on those products and service teams, who don't think of themselves as designers, product managers, developers, other people, stakeholders, the legal team, general managers, they start on their own to make design decisions that aren't all crap. <laughs> right? Developer has to doesn't have a spec, but has to write something. They go off to actually code something up, and they show you the first version, and it's actually pretty good. They've been paying attention. Product manager, faced with deciding between doing this thing and doing that thing, actually makes the decision based on what's best for users and has real user research to make that decision on. That's never happened before, right? And suddenly, we get to a point where non-designers have become fluent in design. And at that point, we are now in infused UX design. And for now, at least, we believe this is the ultimate goal. If we could get 
everybody on our teams to be fluent in design. Not mastery, just fluency. Our job gets so much easier. So that's where we're trying to get to. So, 1997, Disney, definitely in the dark ages, right? They had no idea that what they produced was not a great user experience. They were clueless. But when the Magic Band came out, that Disney, they were infused UX design. The way you spend a billion dollars is on 10,000 people, and I can tell you they do not have 10,000 designers. But they have 10,000 people who produced great designs. So, that's where they ended up. Now, if you're thinking, you're trying to figure out where in this maturity model here your team exists right now, and wherever you are, it has taken you less than 17 years to get there. You are ahead of Disney. <laughs> Just wanted to point that out. It took 17 years for Disney to make this transition. Once we get into the strategy of user experience, we are starting to talk about the long game. It's reactive user experience is very much short. What are we doing this quarter? What are we doing the next sprint? What are we doing right now? But strategy, strategy is a long game. And we are talking years for things to happen. We have to be prepared for years. Now, it's not fair to say that Disney is currently here. And it's not fair to say that because Disney is an organization. And the problem with being an organization is that an organization isn't by itself a thing. An organization is made up of lots of things. In particular, they are made up of what we could call, for lack of a better word, teams. And every team, it turns out, is at its own different level of maturity inside the organization. Some teams are going to be in embedded UX design, while other teams are still in the dark ages. And if you think about your organization, I bet you can think that, yeah, there are some teams that are farther along the scale than others. And how do we figure out where a team is? Well, to do that, we have to break down the team a little further, because it turns out the teams are, in fact, made of people. It's the soil and green of UX. It's, everything is made of people. And, but most importantly, when we think about teams, we have to think about teams of a special group of people, people who influence the user experience. Those are the people who have a say. And some of those have the title of design or think they work in a user experience team. And others don't know anything about design and are, do not think of themselves as user experience team members. But they are part of the team nonetheless. And the thing about it is in any given team, we're going to have people who are at different places in the spectrum. Our designer may be here, but there will be other team members who are at other stages. And we don't assess a team based on sort of the average of all of these. We can't assess the team based on the designer or whoever's in the lead, right? If we give them someone who's twice as good, the team actually doesn't improve. The only way we can see the team improve its maturity is based on the person who is the least mature. We move them up, the team gets better at what they do. And you've all had this experience where you've had someone on the team who just did not get design, maybe a product manager, maybe a development lead, and they held the rest of the team back. You had to spend so much time constantly justifying what you were trying to do. And so that is where we have to focus. We have to focus on the teams 
that are the, the, the team members that are the least mature. That's where our biggest rewards are. We have to get them to, to move up the scale, to get them literacy and then get them fluency. That's all we have to do. If we can get them to be barely fluent, we will see a marked improvement in our organization. I'll tell you another story. For this story, we need to go back to 1953, to the delivery of the Honeywell H model thermostat. This turns out to be a really important UX invention. Because before the H model, the way people controlled the heat in their house or their office buildings is they would have some sort of boiler or furnace or stove. And they would, when they wanted it to be warmer, they'd add more to it. And when they wanted it to be colder, they'd stop putting stuff in it. At best, they would turn it off or turn it on. And that would be that. There was nothing, none of this, hey, let's pick a temperature and just keep things constant. And that's what the H model did. The H model was the first thermostat that was wildly popular to control the temperature at a constant setting. You would just set it at a temperature and then stand your ground for your spouse. <laughs> and so, oh, you've done this, I can tell. <laughs> And so that was it. That was the age model. And this, this thing, the history of this, people don't realize how important this is to the work we do, right? This was created by the amazing designer Henry Dreyfus and his team. And Honeywell had brought Henry Dreyfus in, and they ran through hundreds of prototypes. And they tested this out with real homeowners and real business office people. And they, they did all the things we do today. They did them back in 1953 to design the H model. And this thing was a complete business success. It sold billions, and Honeywell dominated the thermostat market until 2011, when the Nest came. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in all of Canada and 50, uh, 38 states in the United States, it is now a requirement to speak about the nest in any presentation on design. <laughs> this is law. Canada was way ahead of us. I'm just going to put that out there. But I don't want to talk about the design of the nest per se. I don't want to talk about how it uses some sort of intelligence to figure out what you know, is going on in your house. I don't want to talk about that it's you know, actually sort of like the eye of Sauron, and it's looking at you all the time. <laughs> What I want to actually talk about, the thing that I am most interested in at this very moment, is how come Honeywell didn't invent the nest? Why did it take some outside company that had never existed before to be the ones to come up with the nest? Why did Honeywell lose that market? And to understand that, we have to, we have to go to uh, one more. Uh, uh, maturity model here. And that maturity model is uh, uh, how markets mature, how people decide to buy things. And when something first comes out, the first stage is what we call the technology stage. In the technology stage, there's only one product that does the thing, and that's the one you end up buying. Right? Back in the day, when if you wanted a cell phone, the only one you could get was the Motorola StarTac. It cost $4,000. It uh, uh, had a battery life of 30 minutes. It weighed four and a half pounds. And uh, it was a horrible device. But people bought them. People had them. People would buy a second one to have spares. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the beauty of this thing was you could only get one get it from, from Motorola. That was the only one that was there. So they sold a ton of them. But then it wasn't too long before they had a competitor. And at that moment, we had to talk about features. 
So we shift from just talking about what the raw technology can do to actually talking about what the features are. And now we have lots of different features to talk about. And it's, it becomes this sort of battle of checklists, right? You have this, in any ad, there's this table and in, on, your product and their product, and under your product, it says yes, 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 and under their product, it says no, 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 sometimes no, no, no. Right? And that becomes sort of the checklist battle that we see when we get to the feature stage. But there becomes this point where there are actually no more features that a user will care about. Right? You just can't come up with any more features. This is why we got a paperclip from Microsoft. Right? And what else could you do to a word processor? You could make a talking paperclip. Oh, yeah, I'd been missing that. I see you're, you're digging a bit, bitch. Uh, um, so that's where we're at. And suddenly, we get to this point where we are now thinking about experience. When the iPhone first came out, it had fewer features than the best products on the market. The Nokia N95 had just shipped three months before. The team had worked for three years on the Nokia N95, shipped three months before the iPhone, thinking they had produced the most feature-rich phone in the world. And three months later, they, they were all crying in their soup. Because it, the iPhone was what people were choosing. And they were choosing it because it had a better experience, not because it had better features. And we used to think this was the end game, but there's one more inflection point, which is the product starts to become part of a bigger experience. And that's what we call the commodity stage, where the actual thing you used to buy the product for is not important anymore. It's just a commodity. We don't really care about it. Right? Nobody buys a phone to make phone calls anymore. In fact, we have raised an entire generation who hate making phone calls with their phone. <laughs> they all have phones, but the last thing they want to do is make a call. Right? And that's the technology stage, that's the commodity stage, is this last uh, uh, piece of that. And you can see the effects of this. GoGo in flight makes Wi-Fi for airplanes. And it used to be a selling point that you, a flight had GoGo in flight Wi-Fi. And then American Airlines decides to sue them. And the goal of the lawsuit is to break their 10-year contract with GoGo in year five. Because GoGo is not delivering fast enough Wi-Fi. Turns out that other carriers have bought other people's Wi-Fi, and they, uh, people are switching airlines because the Wi-Fi on American is not good enough. Business customers are saying, yeah, I don't want to use American's Wi-Fi. I'm going to fly on a different airline. And suddenly, American, who never thought that Wi-Fi was the reason people bought their product, is losing customers. So they're, they're trying to break this 10-year contract. Now, it turns out that the judge throws the case out, the rationale being, who is stupid enough to sign a 10-year contract for Wi-Fi? <laughs> and they settle. And uh, uh, GoGo has since upgraded their Wi-Fi capabilities, so they're now competitive with what others are offering at great expense to both companies. But nobody chooses the experience when it's just a piece of it, but they think about the whole. And this is what the commodity stage is like. Now, if we want to get 
to the experience of the commodity stages, we have to get to infused UX design. That's key. And so we have to be thinking about how these things are interrelated. But I still haven't asked, answered the question that I started this segment with, which was, why didn't Honeywell invent the nest? And to understand that, we have to map this into the market maturity model, which is that the H model was definitely technology. There was only one source for it, and that's the one you bought. Honeywell, as they started to get competitors, started to dabble in better features, notably things like programmable thermostats, but they were too hard to use, too complex. People just struggled with them. And then the Nest, which has a basic, you know, set it and we'll use our intelligence to, to figure out what, what you really wanted, that is what took over the market. They captured the market at the experience stage. But what's even more interesting is how this fits into design maturity. Because the H model was definitively spot UX design, right? Nobody at Honeywell really understood design, but they trusted Henry Dreyfus and his team, so they came in, the team did their stuff, they produced this amazing product, and when they were done, Henry and his team packed up their stuff, and they left. And then Henry Dreyfus did what all great designers eventually do. He died. <laughs> no, really. I don't know why this surprises you so much. If you are a great designer, you will do this too. <laughs> Happens to all of them. So he left, and Honeywell did not know anything about design after he left. They had not matured as an organization. Nest, on the other hand, they started at infused UX design. That's where they began. And so they had an advantage over Honeywell from the very beginning. Now, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, Honeywell, they're a huge company. They make lots of things. Thermostats was a very small piece of their business. Uh, they, this probably wasn't even on their radar. Okay, I believe that. How much is not being on a radar worth? Well, turns out Google buys Nest for $3.2 billion. That's a lot of radar to miss. <laughs> I'm thinking someone at Honeywell is wishing that that value was at Honeywell and not now at Google. But what I want to talk about here is this problem of how does a startup start at infused UX? Because up until we saw Nest, our theory was, was that every organization had to go through all the stages, that every team had to go through all the stages. How was it they just got to start here? And so we had this theory. And the theory uh, we called the stem cell theory because it, uh, uh, if you think about the way that embryonic stem cells work, there are these cells whose only purpose at the, at the creation of life is to replicate. That's all they do. They just make more embryonic stem cells. And they do that for you know, the, a good part of the, the first trimester. And then suddenly, each of those cells, they don't die off like other cells do. They stay around, but they turn into a different type of cell. Some of them turn into uh, stomach cells. Some of them turn into esophagus cells. Some of them turn into colon cells. And so each of them turns into some other cell. And it's just a sort of magical transformation. And we thought, well, maybe that's what happens, that startups, when they're very small, everybody's doing everything. So there is no notion of maturity at that point. But suddenly, at some point, they pick a spot and they stay there like a stem cell does. And we had some small evidence to support this theory, the biggest thing being that we knew a whole bunch of startups that behave like colons. <laughs> but it turns out that the, that was too convoluted a theory, like many theories, they, you can overdo it. 
this, the theory was a lot simpler. The reason that Nest started at Infused UX Design is because the founder was Tony Fidel. Tony Fidel was the lead designer on the Apple iPod, the Apple iPhone, and the Apple iPad. And Tony Fidel, when he started Nest, did what great founders often do. He went over to Apple and he raided. He recruited his team that he had trained, and he brought them to Nest. So now the initial team all understands design at Apple's expense. Apple taught them how to do that. And so, and then from that point on, every new person they hired had to know something about design. If you wanted to get a job in accounting, you had to understand design because it was designers doing the interviewing. And that's the only thing they knew how to ask about. So they didn't know how to ask about accounting. <laughs> so everybody knew about design. So the whole company was infused because everybody knew about design from the very beginning. Whereas Honeywell, well, Honeywell started with people all over the board, just like every other organization. And as a result, they didn't have the maturity. They never invested in it. They didn't understand it. And they didn't see the nest coming. They were completely blindsided by it. And that's a story that repeats itself in every industry. The existing organizations get completely blindsided by the fact that they don't understand what design is about. And that's the problem. Now, Honeywell had two choices if they wanted to do this. They would either have to fire everybody and rehire a team of only people who understood design, like Nest did, or they'd have to train everybody up, which is an immense expense. But those are the only two choices. That's it. There is one more inflection point I want to tell you about. And that inflection point, before that moment, it starts with a system that, you know, shipping a product, the criteria by which we ship is that it's got to work. And it's got to do what the business needs it to do. But what it doesn't have to do is it doesn't have to be a great design. It's not a requirement. Because we can always fix it in the next release. <laughs> right? We've been told this over and over. <laughs> we'll fix it in the next release. For the longest time, I actually thought that was Microsoft's tagline. <laughs> Are they a sponsor? I don't know if they're a sponsor. Um, and so the inflection point happens when a mind shift changes. And the mind shift is that at this point, yes, if we're going to ship something, it has to work. It has to meet our business needs. But we are going to hold back and not ship it if it's not well designed. We're going to wait until we get the design we want, which means we have to have conversations about what the design is, we have to understand what the design is, but we are going to wait. We call this the UX tipping point. This is the inflection point we are trying to get to when our organization starts to wait. I had a, a product manager the other day send me an email, completely overjoyed that for the first time in the years that he's been at this organization, his management gave him permission to not ship something. I've never seen someone ex more excited about not shipping something than this guy. And it was because they had made their first inroads into the tipping point. And when Disney finally shipped the Magic Man in 2014, it was two years late. It was a seven-year project that was only supposed to take five years. Two years. Billion dollar investment. The lead product managers for this project were getting calls every day from the board of Disney. And they were calling and saying, are we shipping today? Are we shipping today? He was like, nope, not ready yet. We're not ready yet. They could have shipped, 
a partial system. The hotel room doors worked. Some of the payment systems in the park worked, but the rides weren't working. The connectivity throughout the park was scattered and they had a lot of trouble with the initial wiring. They had to rip stuff out and put it back. So they, it was costly. And it was a top, top secret project. They didn't want any of their competitors learning they were working on this because they didn't want someone creating a, a knockoff and, and beating them to the story. So they wanted to be the ones to talk about this. And they didn't ship for two years. That's the UX tipping point. So how do we make this happen? My friend Dan Mall likes to talk about design process. Design process is one of these funny things, right? We fetish about our process. We talk about our process all the time. We, we put up charts and say, this is what our design process is. We create memos. When we work with a new team, we say, this is our design process. When we interview candidates to join our team, we ask them, what's your design process? As if we're going to let them use it. <laughs> Hell, we're probably not even going to let them use our process, because we never get to use our process. <laughs> Because we imagine, Dan Mall says, we imagine design process to be like a Newton's pendulum where you pull back the ball and you let it go and it works exactly the same every time. But we all know process doesn't work this way. It doesn't work exactly the same every time. It is not repeatable. So this fetish we have about process, this gets in our way. Dan likes to put it another way. He likes to think of it like more like a, a football pitch. Right? When the teams come running down onto the sports ball field, you know, the hockey diamond or the <laughs> baseball court. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they don't come with a giant Gantt chart that has swim lanes for every player that says exactly what time in the game they will do certain things. Right? They don't have this giant chart and the product manager doesn't turn to Harold and say, Harold, I need you to score at four minutes and 22 seconds this, this game because that's where you scored last game and it worked really well for us. Could you do that? Brilliant, that would be wonderful, thank you. This is, this is not how the game is played. The game is a system and we have to adapt to the systemic elements of this. We have to adapt to the fact that there are uh, uh, conditions of the field and we have players on the injured list and they have players on the injured list and they have strengths and weaknesses and we have strengths and weaknesses. And we're, sometimes we're playing early in the season and sometimes it's right before the playoffs and everything we do makes a difference and so we have to be adaptive. We have to be able to uh, uh, be flexible. We have to think in terms of plays, not process, but plays. What are the plays that we have at our disposal and which ones are we going to call for the game right now? And so we started to look at this and say, well, are there such a thing as UX strategy plays? And it turns out that we found, yes, there are. In fact, if we go around to teams, we can have them tell us the things that they've done that have been successful for them. We've accumulated 130 of these plays. And we can break them up into whether they're literacy plays and fluency plays and mastery plays. And this is just a small subset of the plays that we've identified. And in these plays, we can start to look at what is the, uh, uh, what are the things that help teams be effective. And every team's going to need something different. But I want to sort of go over three of them right now because there are, there are three that, that tend to keep popping up. The first one we call immersive exposure. And immersive exposure is uh, when we get to spend time exposing everybody on our team, all of the influencers, to our users, actually having them experience what it's like firsthand to use our product or service. And this is very much of a literacy play, because in this process, we get to see 
what's good and what's bad. And if we've never done this before, we're going to focus on the bad. Because that's what's going to jump out at us. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe people go through this. And so things like usability tests are a good place to start, right? This is where a lot of organizations start. You get somebody into a usability test and they have a religious moment. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's so hard to do that thing with our product. You know, and, and, and you've seen that. You've seen that experience. It's even better if we can get them out into the field and be in the customer's environment. Because it turns out, whatever happens in the lab, it's much more complicated in the customer environment. And so, so if we can get them out there, that's, that's fantastic. And it turns out there's a point of exposure where you start to see dramatic improvements in the product. And that comes when we get to two hours every six weeks. So for every influencer. So if we can get each influencer into the field for two hours every six weeks, we will see dramatic improvements in the quality of the product. So that's the goal. That's where we want to start. And we can do simple things when we're there, right? Just having whoever the most senior people that are with us on that trip be in charge of the journey map, right? Where we say, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to list out the various activities the user's going to do. We're going to put this on a scale of extreme frustration to extreme delight. And as the user goes through each of these steps, I want you to make a note. Where is it frustrating? Where is it delightful? And you just record the delightful bits, the frustrating bits, the delightful bits, the frustrating bits. And just that, having a senior person make this chart in real time, they come out of that session going, I can't believe how hard we make it for people. I never want to have to put these frustrating things down again. What are we going to do to fix this? Like, oh, that's a good idea. Let's go fix that. Yes, yes. I wish we'd thought of that. And so, so that's the thing, right? That's exposure. That's where we want to go. We can combine this with another play which is called developing a shared experience vision. And when we create a shared experience vision, this is, helps with both literacy and mastery. And what this is, is this is getting everybody on the team to understand where we're trying to get to, right? So the, the exposure tells us where we are. This is where are we trying to go? What would an ideal experience be like? And we can think of this as having a flag in the sand one that's at the horizon, that's far away, that we can clearly see. And if we can clearly see that flag, everybody can march towards the flag. And we can direct all the teams to just make, take baby steps, march towards the flag, march towards the flag. So that's what we're doing. Now, how do we figure out where that vision should be? Well, we can take our, our journey map and we can just ask the question, what happens if we make it all the way delightful? What happens if we make it delightful all the way across? That's our experience vision. Now, if we combine that with a shift in culture, changing the culture to be a culture of continuous learning, that allows us to focus on all the aspects of growth, literacy, fluency, and mastery. And what we're talking about is constant learning about who our users are, what they're trying to do, what our skills are, what we could do better, what our capability is in the organization. Constant growth. Now, in our industry, we also fetish on failure. We talk a lot about failure. We talk about we need to fail fast, we need to fail often, we need to move fast and break things. And I'm, I don't buy this. I don't think anyone wants to get called into the CEO's office and have to answer the question, why did we fail? I'm not buying this. The only way you learn is by failing. I'm not buying it because I know a whole bunch of people who seem to learn, fail a lot and never learn a damn thing from it. <laughs> and I know a bunch of people who actually seem to be able to learn without having any catastrophic failures. 
Nobody wants to be called into the CEO's office to answer the question, why did we fail? Right? Well, we failed because that's our goal. And in fact, we, were, we thought it was so important that you be part of that failure that we made it really big. <laughs> and they're not going to buy this, right? What we want is a culture where the question is not, why did we fail? The question is, what did we learn, right? Things will go wrong. We can mitigate risk, but things will still go wrong. What we want to focus on is, what did we learn? That's the more important question. We don't want to focus on failure. We want to focus on learning. Part of our organization at, at Center Center UIE is, is a school that we have in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where we're creating brand new UX designers. We graduated our first cohort last October, and, and uh, uh, we're starting a second cohort in the spring. Uh, the students, every day, as part of their education, have to do a stand-up. We're training them to work in a real job, so we do real job rituals. And one of the rituals is a stand-up. And we have the sort of standard questions for a stand-up. What did you do? What are you going to do? Uh, uh, what's preventing you from doing the things you need to do? What's your highest priority? Right? Those sorts of things. But then we have this fifth question. And the fifth question is, what is the most important thing you've learned and how will it change what you do in the future? Imagine every day having to report what you've learned in the last 24 hours and how it's going to change the way you work going forward. And not only you have to do this, but everyone else in the organization from top to bottom is talking about every day something that they didn't know the day before. They are admitting they did not know something and now they know it and it's going to change the way they think about things. That's a culture of continuous learning. And if we can get everyone to be talking about learning all the time and focusing on that, we can create the shared experience vision and we can take advantage of the exposure and we can deliver better products. Out of the 130 plays, if you did just these three plays, you would see improvement in your organization almost immediately. And if you did that, you could deliver a product that works like the magic band, where a six-year-old walks up on her first day in the park. She puts her wrist in front of the magic Mickey. That's what that thing is called. It makes this characteristic sound and delightful light pattern. And then every... Disney cast member, every employee who's standing in about a, t a three uh, meter uh, uh, radius of that magic Mickey turns around, looks at the kid, and says, happy birthday, Angela. That's cool. It's a little creepy, <laughs> but it's definitely cool. That's how we deliver great products and services. So this is what I came to talk to you about. We have uh, we have to grow from uh, unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. We have to help our teams get to that point. We have to help them get fluent. And we're going to do that by going through the steps of understanding where they are today, helping them through design as a service, then through embedded UX design, and eventually, hopefully, to infused UX design. And we need a playbook, a playbook that's filled with plays that are unique to our situation. Every team will have a different one, and we're going to create that. If you're interested in what those plays are and things of that sort, we now have a new newsletter that we are uh, uh, delivering, which is uh, on strategy. This is different than other emails that you may have gotten from us. So if you aren't getting, it's called UX Strategy with Jared Spool. That's me. Uh, and you can sign up at this email address. Also, uh, we have a 
two-day workshop that helps organizations go through uh, the strategy plays. You can find out about that at UIE.com. You can also find articles and other resources on this and a video library with 370 videos in it called All You Can Learn. And finally, uh, you can contact me at that email address. If, we're not, if you work in design and we're not connected on LinkedIn, please, by all means, reach out on LinkedIn and connect with me. That's a good way to get my attention, and I'd love to learn more about what you're up to. And finally, uh, you can follow me on the Twitters at, at JM Spool, where I tweet about design, design strategy, design education, and the amazing customer service habits of the airline industry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, th thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. There you are. <laughs> Thank you. That was, uh, that was quite an amazing talk. And uh, of course, I think folks who are from working in startups got to learn about how they do not have to cross the tipping point. Folks in enterprises learning about the challenges. And I think agency folks learned how to speak to both the, both the sides of the table. Uh, but that was an amazing talk, Jared, and thank you so much for coming back again. Thank you. Uh, and being our uh, opening keynote speaker. I think we don't have a lot of time, but we can take one question, okay. if you're up for it. Sure. Uh, That'd be were, a good one. Yeah, so there were, there were almost three, four questions which um, almost paraphrase around the same, um, uh, same curiosity, same question, which was how do we balance slash juggle uh, between the pressures of not shipping something um, versus you know, meeting the business needs in order to make revenue and not waiting to release products. So the justifications and the risks, how do you balance both? Oh, sure, that's a simple question. <laughs> um, uh, there's, a couple, there's a couple ways to tackle this. One is you could do phase shipping. Disney didn't want to do phase shipping because, because the first phase was rolling out a band that didn't do very much and they wanted the band to be amazing and, and have the Disney magic in it. Mm -hmm. So they were, uh, they were compelled. But most organizations are not in that situation. And you could say, well, what if we just worked with hotel rooms? What if we just did this? And in fact, they, they sort of faked it. They, uh, um, they started issuing hotel room keys that had the exact same electronics in it as the magic band did. And you could use them to, first you could use them to open your hotel room door, of course, but then you could use them to get uh, VIP rides on the park, and you could use them to pay while you're in the park, and they, they could start to track uh, uh, location. And so they were actually delivering, and that's how they knew they weren't ready to roll out the band, right. but they were, they were introducing the functionality piece by piece and very stealth. So many people, did, they weren't making any PR announcements about it, they were keeping it stealth, but they were rolling it out. And so therefore, they were, they were getting the, the capability of, of, of doing just that. So there are, there are lots of strategies for this, but that, that, that's how Disney pulled it off. Awesome. Thank you, Thank everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, George. So I've, I've not been to the Disney park, but uh, that, was, uh, that sounded like a really amazing experience.